Good morning. Welcome to Bible study today. We are looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. Father, please open us to your word and open your word to us that we might hear from you, dear God. Please teach us. Teach us, I pray, dear God, in Christ's name. Amen. Um, again, a very difficult chapter, as we've said, 2 Timothy is. We finished last Friday with 2 Timothy 2. Chapter 3 opens up. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now he doesn't exact. He doesn't define exactly. Paul doesn't define exactly what last days means, um, because you know we we don't know. We don't know what the last days will be. He this is spoken of at times in uh, the letters. These last days. It is, here's the, the, the most true sense of the words last days or definition. When Christ came, died, rose again, ascended into heaven, that began the last days. God's gift of salvation has been given to us and Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but who but have everlasting life. But this begins the last days. So uh, this is this when when Paul speaks of the last days, this is the time frame that he's including. It's it's pretty broad. It began a long time ago. It hasn't ended yet, but it will. He says, men will, will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding, and here's, here's the cap, here's the cap to all this. Verse 5, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these. That in itself is, is a full study that could take hours. And we have minutes, I'm already three and a half minutes into our time today. A couple of interesting things there. I, I want to turn back in my Old Testament uh, readings of today because there was something uh, that I saw and I was hoping to be able to uh, turn to it. Yes, I did. Um, well, let me go ahead and say it. Uh, it's interesting in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this sin, which we could certainly say, oh my goodness, how horrible all that is. Isn't it interesting he puts disobedient to parents? Disobedience to parents is a sign of the difficult times to come. Now, in my Bible readings, and actually it was for yesterday, March 28th, in my Old Testament readings, one of the laws, one of the guidelines given by God to Moses says in, in Deuteronomy 21, beginning in verse 18, Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, if any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, 
And when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them. Verse 19, then his father and mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown. And they shall say to the, to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Well, that's horrible. And it says in verse 21, then all the men of the city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from your midst and all Israel shall hear of it and fear. Well, that certainly isn't done today. And that certainly is a more uh, stern approach than, than we certainly have. But to God, disobedience is a very serious matter especially disobedience to God our Father. Look at all those sins there, and do they not sound familiar in so many ways? Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control. I'm just skipping through some of them. But, the, but such a serious one, verse 5 is, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. What does that mean? See, a lot of people believe in God, but really don't hold to godliness. They really don't, they don't have a sense of his power over them, in charge of them. They, they believe in God, but don't really obey God. Don't see a different lifestyle that pertains to the one who is godly. But they still call themselves godly. They still have a form of godliness, but it has no power to it. Paul says, avoid such people. Well, we would be very lonely, wouldn't we? I just wonder if our circles are much larger than what God would have them to be of people around us and of influences, of influences. In verses 6 uh, through 9, he speaks of... Uh, the power that men can have over women, particularly in ways of saying that it's godly what they are, they are doing and it's not. There is a person in my life years ago, a number of years ago, who as a teenage girl was very attractive and was taken, was seduced by men in the church who said that they that she was serving God by serving them. This is what Ravi Zacharias, a recently deceased uh, minister, preacher, uh, was saying to women to seduce them. You see, to take God and use him as the, the power, the, the foundation for why a woman should provide you Sexual pleasure is a sin. That's what he's speaking of here. Verse 10, he picks back up. You, but you, Timothy, followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So he was saying, you know, and, and uh, in verse 12, you know, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The Christian should expect it. And we don't like that thought. We think if people are against us, then something is wrong and needs, you know, well, something's not wrong. God, why are you letting me down? Why don't people like me? Why do I not have friends? 
Could be because they're ungodly and God is wanting to keep you away from them because they are influencing your behavior. So persecution will happen to the individual who seeks to live for God. And as, as it says in verse 5, really what it's saying we need to have is not only a form of godliness, but the power of it. We need to have the power of godliness in our lives. And it's not easy. And you know, all that I'm teaching, when I was in a wreck in 2012, it changed me. And then even more, there were changes in my life by the end of 2013. And God has been teaching me in the, these last years godliness. I understand more. I understand more. But you know, it takes separation. It, it takes study. You got to learn God's word. You got to let it learn you. You got to listen to God. You can't just be like everybody else. That's not what the Christian is. That's the whole idea of what the church was formed for. A place where the godly can have home and separation. So, he says beginning in, uh, I don't know, in verse 13, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, verse 14, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul has already spoken uh, about Timothy's upbringing uh, with, uh, in verse 5 of chapter 1, uh, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. Timothy was blessed with a godly upbringing. And he said, you, you stay in that. You continue in that which you were taught. Verse 16 of uh, and 17 are probably scriptures, possibly, that you've heard. Oh, we're coming to the end of the chapter. I didn't, it came more quickly than I thought today. Um, scriptures here at the close of chapter 3, which you possibly have heard, but are so important. And today I pray that you'll dwell on these. Consider these. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I always am quick to say, now when he says man, he means person. He's speaking in the proper English form as I was corrected in my book. Uh, of how, but this is how we're supposed to say things, but it means every individual. Look what he says there. All scripture, all of this book is inspired by God. Inspired is inspire. God breathed. God has breathed into this. God has breathed it. It is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. Reproof and correction go together to reprove someone for correction. Make sure that it's from God's word when you tell someone they're doing wrong. Be able to show them. That's why you need to know God's word. For training in righteousness. That's part of that teaching. For training in righteousness. That the, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All right. Um, great. Praise God. That was about 15 minutes, a little over 15 minutes today. Uh, down from 30. 
could have gone through a lot more, but that, that's a good summary of, of chapter three. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to, uh, to uh, put them below, text them below, comment below. Let me know. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. If you need me, let, just give me a shout. Good to see you today. Bye now.